Hello there, this is Coden. And this is Cassia. Welcome to the Evan Hawk, a podcast where we discuss Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic, as well as everything Star Wars. Today, we'll discuss the cast and technology episodes of Disney Gallery, The Mandalorian, and discuss what a Knights of the Old Republic era galaxy should look like on screen. So let's uh, let's get us kick started with a listener question. So at one Burdarqua asks, is the white and brown Jedi Revan that Black Series presented, where in his timeline does he wear these robes? Was it after he got his memory wiped, but before the novel? What do you think, Cassia? What I think it is, is you can get some light-sided robes on the Star Forge. It didn't ever have the mask, but I think Galaxy of Heroes Revan they created a Darth Revan and a Jedi Revan. And Darth Revan wears uh, black, the mask, and has a red lightsaber. Then the Jedi Revan has the same robes. They're just in white. Same silhouette, same mask, but he has a purple lights- lightsaber. And I, I kind of like this approach they have because it shows him light-sided, but... Um, it just doesn't have one of the faces because I kind of think none of the faces look that great. So you can just kind of imagine a face. So everyone can kind of project like if it's the male Revan or female Revan or whatever you want. It's just the ultimate light sighted redeemed Revan who knows who he is. And he's about to uh, face Bastila and Darth Malak. So it it is before the novel, I would say. Um, I was just going to agree that I, I like that they include the mask because, uh, as you said, it it allows the idea that his face could be anything. I tend to associate the masked Revan as the the pre-Kotor Revan, which right up against the beginning of the game, he's kind of the dark side Revan, but uh, I guess he's worn his mask before that. And so it's not necessarily associated with his dark side light side time but it's a it's a mandalorian mask that he's used in battle so um next thing we want to talk about is the disney gallery the mandalorian the tv series going on disney plus about the mandalorian tv show um so what i loved about episode three it's all about the cast and it introduces pedro pascal who plays the mandalorian and it has Gina Carano, who plays Cara Dune, and Carl Weathers, who plays Grief Karga. So it starts out focusing on the Mandalorian of the Mandalorian. Uh, Pedro Pascal is the voice. He wanted to make his character, even though he's masked, human and accessible. And he does that with great attention in his voice acting. And two of the other Uh, people who portray the Mandalorian is Brendan Wayne, who kind of does that gunslinger uh, physicality. I believe he's also descended from uh, John Wayne, if you've ever heard of him. Um, I think he did some cowboy movies or something. And then the stuntman Latif Crowder, he's the jujitsu, kaporia, uh, martial arts expert, the stuntman. So... It's kind of like you have a holy trinity of three guys, one masked, and they, they all create the Mandalorian. And it, it is interesting, like, how he wears a mask. One thing that was interesting is I'm listening to the biography of George Lucas, and I just had been listening to the creation of the character Boba Fett, and... I've already done an Inspired a Galaxy post on The Mandalorian and how it was inspired by the man with no name, kind of like the T-visors the Mandalorians have. It's kind of inspired by that low-cut hat kind of going across their 
face, the poncho and the gruff attitude. So it, it was kind of nice to just see how the biography mentioned that as well and uh, how this documentary or docu-series mentions that. They're really playing up the gunfighter iconography. Pedro Pascal says, I love the opportunity to make him as human and as accessible as possible, which is strange to say because it's impossible to get to him because he's covered in armor from head to toe. And yet the idea is that, you know, he's relatable. We're all kind of covered in our own armor and terrified of taking that armor off. And that's the thing that crosses him over into a character that we're all going to really want to follow. So I thought that was a, a good examination of the Mandalorian character. But when you are directing, it's really hard to, to direct sometimes because actors need something to act against and viewers want something to respond to. So how they solve that is just the Mandalorian, he is very stiff. He doesn't move a lot. He's not like a wavy person. They keep him very still, kind of like a caged animal, just so when his ge when he gestures, it, it means something. And it's just funny to watch Pedro Pascal voice acting because he'll just have like finger guns, pretending like he's in a shootout and then like holding a, a, a pillow like it's Baby Yoda. I was just going to make a comparison. One, one other product that does a very similar... I guess has a very similar challenge to this uh, type of character where they're just masked all the time is the the Halo series with uh, Master Chief. You know, the Master Chief never takes off his armor either. And so the, they have this challenge of getting the viewer to connect with this, this faceless character trying to convey like the emotions and things. And uh, I think that the Mandalorian does a really good job of uh, allowing the viewer to get to know the Mandalorian in a way that a lot of dramas can do just by the just analyzing the face and and the emotions projected from the actor's face. Yeah, I think there's more character development in this show where he's masked than a lot of shows where they have even more episodes and the face isn't covered up. Yeah, and then there is uh, Gina Carano's uh, Cara Dune, and what I liked about her is that. Sometimes in movies, you kind of just have someone who is maybe like five foot and doesn't really seem like they can fight. And they're the ones cast in movies where they're like supposed to be the tough person and be fighting. But what I like is that uh, Gina Carano was an MMA fighter and she's been in Haywire and Deadpool and she doesn't have to act tough because she's just she just is tough. It's interesting because uh, she was in, she was featured in the story illustrations during Pedro Pascal's first meetings talking about the Mandalorian. So she was a part of it from the beginning, even maybe before she was approached. Uh, she says because I don't feel like the regular actress, and I don't think I'm ever going to be very Hollywood. So I just feel like the people that find me like are people that. And then Pedro Pascal says, see a little bit of your soul. And she says, yes, thank you for that. And I think every girl or woman can kind of get behind that. And what I like is that Jon Favreau, he compared her fight scenes with Indiana Jones. In the Indiana Jones movies, when Harrison Ford takes a punch, he's not like a superhero who acts like that didn't hurt. He's like, ow, that hurts. And if he like hurts his hand, it hurts his hand. And that's something that separates it from different action movies and she's just able to do the action do it well and and it kind of just reflects like the old time movies where if they were casting a western they wouldn't get an actor to pretend to be a cowboy they would find a cowboy and then have someone who knows what they're doing and then they learn the the acting what are your thoughts on the character of Cara Dune I, I've seen her in in a few movies where she just kind of she is just kind of the tough girl. Um, she's also in Fast and Furious 6. And I think that she has gotten better as an actress. Um, I think The Mandalorian is one of her strongest like displays of being an actress. 
And you know, I at first I was like, oh, they they pulled Cara Dune, but then after the, after watching her first episode, I was like, you know what? I actually really like this uh, this portrayal and this role that she has for this show. And yeah, it's kind of hard to see them just kind of going the regular Hollywood route of just finding a face to just kind of fill in a female role in the show. And then there is uh, Carl Weathers, who plays Grief Karga. And I, I kind of talked about him more uh, in episode 23 because he was someone who studied lots of literature and uh, studied Joseph Campbell. The way he described his character is like it's a John Huston or Orson Welles. Like, he fills the space, and he doesn't see himself as a bad guy. He sees Grief Karga as a character with flaws and who's tempted, which I kind of like that even though it seems like he kind of turns, he kind of turns it around in the finale. It just, it seemed more authentic than maybe just Ray saying like, no, I am not going to sell BB-8, even though I could get lots of money and portions because I'm just that good of a person, you know, like, I, I liked how he kind of reminded me of an actual, like, you know, bounty hunter or kind of a smuggler character. And something they're originally going to do is just have Carl Weathers, and they're going to just make his character an alien who died in the third episode, and I'm glad they kept him around, because I think he's going to be in the second season, and I think Carl Weathers may even direct an episode. Uh, what are your thoughts before uh, we move on to episode four? I liked Carl Weathers' character, Grief Karga. He he just kind of portrayed a, I don't know, just like a, a happy businessman, just being that relayer for uh, for bounty contracts. And he liked doing business with the Mandalorian because the Mandalorian like, always fulfilled the, the bounty request. So it made him look good. The um, Mandalorian obviously was a good client to have. And uh, yeah, I thought, I thought the character worked really well. So... Rebels dot resistance brings a good segue to the episode four of the Disney Gallery. The technology they used on Mando was so insane, just caught up on the docu series, and I was mind blown. So episode four is an episode on the how they put the episodes together, just the technology they used. So go ahead and get us started, Cassia. Okay, so how they put it together, the Mandalorian TV series, is they use the volume and what the volume is is it is like a wall and a ceiling of projected tv screens so what they can do is like set up sets and then they can use like vr technology uh using like pre-rendered cgi and they can change the position of shots they need the vr so they're able to not just have the actors working on green screen, but they are surrounded by the world, you know, of the Mandalorian when they're doing their shots. And it creates a lot less work in the editing room because it's all rendered and it makes it easier for the actors to work in. And I see this as a game changer. This is kind of what George Lucas had in mind for the prequels. I mean, he used green screens, but he was always like 10 or 20 years ahead of his time. And I think current film CGI wouldn't be possible or look as good without what Lucas developed, especially in the prequels. I mean, if you look at the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I don't think it would exist without the prequels. And speaking of the MCU, Jon Favreau, he directed the first installment in the MCU. He directed Iron Man. So he kind of was even just working with ILM, Industrial Light and Magic, even then. So he was kind of talking about his process. There's a process to CGI. It's not, you can't just do it. You can't fix everything in post. You have to plan it out so the lights and shadows look good. So he's talking about the Jungle Book, which that's kind of a smart tie-in to Disney+. Plus. It's like, you can watch this. It's on Disney+, Plus, you know. But he was explaining how they would have the foliage and light and shadow but then kind of be surrounded by blue screen. And sometimes they thought it would be a faster process, but it was a bit slow. Because sometimes what was created didn't match the previs. So sometimes they would have to refilm things and you couldn't quite some of the shots. It's like, man, if we just had it two feet up, it would, it would look a lot better. So it kind of took twice as long. Uh, so then they improved uh, that process with the Lion King. And it, it was kind of animated 
from the original shot for shot, basically. And I kind of talked about this in episode 23 as well. So what they would do is they would use the virtual environment and kind of look at it to frame the shot with VR to help them visualize and set up shots in that virtual environment. I, I kind of went over in episode 23 that I think that The Lion King was done just so they could create this technology and kind of have some money to come in after they completed it. And then you get to The Mandalorian. After like all these processes have been developed and kind of refined, the people, the team come to work on it and they want to push tech forward with it because the tech is less expensive and it's better now. So they're able to work with it within their time frame and on the budget they need. And when they create the show, they go from storyboards to pre and then they can visualize it on the volume. Uh, so what are your thoughts so far on the volume? The one, the one comment I have with how they put the Mandalorian together is that I liked how whenever possible they tried to film an authentic scene, which is very reminiscent to the original Star Wars trilogy and only used like the CGI when they really needed it. So The Mandalorian, John Favreau says, it is the first show to use real-time rendering and video wall in camera set extensions and effects. And I foresee a lot of Disney Plus shows using this to create great looking shows. And especially during this time when a lot of writers are kind of just having to stay at home, I foresee Disney saying, like Disney Plus saying, we need a whole lot more content to offer on our streaming service show. So you're seeing a lot of like projected show ideas because sometimes shows don't take as much collateral as a movie. So I just wonder if we'll see maybe like a Pirates of the Caribbean or John Carter of Mars show on Disney+. Plus. And I expect we will see a lot of copycats from different studios as well now that the recipe is sort of out. This is a game changer for movies. What the volume was, it's... It's an LED big room and ceiling. It's just a wall and ceiling of projected screens. So everything is in camera and a lot of work planning and writing goes into each shot ahead of time, but that helps the directors visualize things and they are prepared. What I love is like, even if they're filming on a set, like most of the shots for The Mandalorian they are filmed on a set. It doesn't look like a set. Like I was like, "What for episode five? Like they're on they're on Tatooine. How how did they do that? You know, like that that's Tatooine." And then they're like, "No, that was a set in the volume." And it just kind of like the first time I heard that, I I didn't really believe it. I think that also helps with. I mean, you have big budget shows, Game of Thrones. Most of the scenes were leaked because. People would just be flying drones, you know, and taking pictures of everything. And uh, I think that's why people had, like, no idea what was going to be happening in The Mandalorian is because it was filmed on a very controlled set. I have liked the introduction of drones in the film space because before to get, like, a high-rise shot, you either had to use, like, a crane apparatus, which is a lot of work to set up. Or you're using like a helicopter to take a shot. And it's a pretty big commitment to get a particular camera angle where now you have access to drones that can take some really high re- high quality, high resolution um, airborne shots that really add some good depth to a uh, senior shooting. Yeah, I mean, drones are being used more in filmmaking. What I was referring to was that the paparazzi was using the drones to kind of be able to fly their drone and be able to see like, oh, this is John landing on Dragonstone, you know? And it's like, mm-hmm. oh, here is uh, Baratheon's son, you know? And so, so that kind of got leaked. But what I like is when they're shooting 
on the volume, it's not like they're just surrounded by green screen, kind of how it was in uh, some of the prequels sets. Even though Natalie Portman is a great actress, I think a lot of actors and actresses, they can get lost in a sea of green screen or blue screen. And you just sometimes see videos of them making the prequels and it's like Natalie Portman just looks lost, you know, in a sea of green or blue screen. So that's not happening now because it's there when they step on set. Even with like experienced actors in a green screen environment, if you uh, want a cool documentary is like watching the the Anakin Obi Wan fight kind of materialize, and just how much prep work it took to for George Lucas or the stunt coordinator to be like, all right, well, right here we're gonna have lava falling down, so you need to like make your way over here. And then just all that, all that prep work of like, this is what's happening in the environment and we need you to react this way. It's a lot of yeah. things to have to commit to memory while you're trying to do like a major stunt sequence. And so this, this new um, method of projection allows uh, actors and actresses to kind of like naturally react to what's going on around them and, and focus on what they need to do. Yeah. Cause I mean, even in the prequels, they had previs, but I think it was kind of act asking a lot of the actors in the prequels. And I don't think George is the most conversational of directors. I just wonder what the prequels would have been like if he would have waited a few years or maybe he wasn't the one directing or writing, but that's kind of a another topic for another day. But kind of speaking of uh, the VR... So they are using the Unreal Engine, like game engine technology, so they can like tweak and move the shot when they are filming. They're able to do this on a show because they're able to commit resources and they have a company that wanted to do this. And you just kind of watch this episode. When the camera moves while they are filming the shot, the, the projector screens change when the camera moves. Like it happens in real time and you watch it and it's just mind blowing. And I, I just think I would be like kind of freaked out if I were in there. And also like in awe, like it's just incredible to see what's possible now. It's interesting because if they would have had green screen, you know, Mandalorian's helmet, it's basically like a mirror. That's something Taika Week T brought up. Cause I remember watching Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets and you see Harry's glasses when he's talking to Dobby you can see a tennis ball, like a green tennis ball in his glasses because that was the stand-in for Dobby and there was a reflection. But with uh, this show, you don't have the problem because everything it's catching is the real environment that's that you can see in his helmet. So even though his helmet's like a mirror, they can embrace that. And some other advantages to this technology is that you can edit on the same day and fix things. You don't have to fly back to Norway to fix shots or build another set and fix it in post and take up even more money. Giancarlo Esposito, who played Moff Gideon, he says, now we have a room where there are things that you can see, where I can climb up on the top of my TIE fighter and see the horizon. You don't have to make it all up anymore. Because... I remember seeing that finale and I was like, how, how on earth did they film that? And they're like, it was, it was on a stage. How, how do you do that? And after you watch that episode, you can visualize it a lot easier. And it's funny that you brought up the fight uh, with Anakin and Obi-Wan because you had the lava and they had it to explain it and they had previs. But with this cast, when they're going through the lava tunnel, the cast didn't have to imagine it. The walls were moving. You could see on one end, the side of the tunnel, the exit where they were approaching was getting bigger and the other side, the hole would get smaller. So it's like they don't have to pretend as much. It's as liberating as anything that Carl Weathers has worked on, you know? Um, because you have four people in that boat and they're not all imagining something different. They, they can just see it. Favreau and Kathleen Kennedy were saying in this episode that George Lucas was always 10 years ahead of his time. And 
he always wanted to build something like this, but he was just too early. And now he's able just to see that it, it's finally happening. And we'll just see what everyone is coming up with. And I think it is great uh, for the cinematic and TV landscape. Well, let's, uh, let's take a quick break and then we'll be back to discuss our final topic. So now we wanted to talk about the technology and visuals and a potential Nice Old Republic adaptation. So what should the on-screen look of Nice Old Republic be? Um, should it look more of like an ancient setting or kind of like an existing Star Wars movie? Um, this is a question that we posted to our followers on Instagram, and we're going to be covering that a little bit. So Cassie, go ahead and get us kicked off. So this is something I've been thinking about for a while. I remember an exchange I had for like a High Republic post and it was from William J. Wrights and he says, the only issue I had with the Old Republic being 4,000 years before is that the technology literally didn't change in that time. If a year in Star Wars is equivalent to one Earth year, then technological evolution hit a huge stagnation period that realistically speaking is like a 4,000 year dark age. And I guess the way I see it is that maybe just Star Wars is just so advanced that that he kind of hit some uh, measure of a technological standstill just because they're so advanced. Because I think a year in Star Wars is maybe a bit shorter, but I don't think it, the length of their years is that off. So what do you think uh, about uh, William's comment? One of the one of the big, I guess, like telltales of like the the advancement of technology is the size of the space structures used in a lot of the old Republic ship designs. The kind of the big the big cruisers at the time were no bigger than like a hammerhead corvette. That'd be the exception of some of the Sith carriers. But like a lot of these cruisers were about that size and it wasn't until the Galactic Empire where things became much larger where you started seeing like the Imperial Star Destroyers and the like the executor class Star Destroyers, the Super Star Destroyer. So like up until that point, the technology was all the same, the hyperdrives, the life support, all that, but it was just confined to a much smaller space that was later capable in larger spaces in space. You kind of get the feeling that hyperspace travel maybe takes longer in Knights of the Old Republic and the droids still look a little bit chunkier and the ships look a little bit different, kind of smaller, also kind of chunkier. So it seems like it's in the same galaxy, not exactly the same galaxy. Yeah, I think it's hard to think of Star Wars without a lot of that space tech. And so going back to a like a KOTOR adaptation or something even um, before that time, I think that we'd still want the, the technology present just so that it keeps the integrity of being like a Star Wars story. And yeah. so I don't really have a big problem with the, the technology presented. Whereas like if they were like, this is what Star Wars was before they made it to space. I mean, there it would be, I don't think a Star Wars story confined to one like planetary space would be, be that entertaining. I think that once they are capable of hyperspace travel, kind of their technology probably it's advanced. It's it's usually consistent when they once they get to that point. It's just interesting because I think sometimes if they do it so it looks similar, like it's in the same ballpark as a, a Star Wars film, like a Knights of the Old Republic adaptation, some people would be like I wanted to see something new, something different. And then if they kind of went the new and different route, they would probably be like, I wanted it to look the way that it did when I was 10 years old. So sometimes I think it's just kind of impossible to make people happy. 
but I think I think they can balance it in a way where it looks some of the details are different, but it is within the realm of the Star Wars galaxy, even if it is 4,000 years ago. A longer time ago says ancient. Star Wars.lore says more ancient. And at Cal underscore Kextus 66 says ancient as well. And then we move on to at Astro underscore Notka underscore art says more ancient. And they better be TV series in my opinion. Uh, seeing the technology utilized in The Mandalorian, do you think a Knights of the Old Republic adaptation is more feasible as a TV series now, or would you rather it be a movie? Uh, I think that goes back to the discussions we've had earlier on TV show versus movie. I think if we're telling an Old Republic story that's outside of the video game, uh, I think a TV show would be great if we're going to be pretty focused on the crew of the Ebon Hawk. I think a, like a three film trilogy would be great. So uh, gray underscore Jedi underscore 101 says more ancient since it was a long time ago before the movies at wardrobe of shirts is also saying more ancient based off the same video games and comics. So I mean, if you look at the video games, uh, they have a good, I would say, design to them that I'd be comfortable with in a movie. Because I think even the, the artists for Knights of the Old Republic 1, when they're kind of figuring out how to design this universe, uh, they, they talked to Ralph McQuarrie. And I think that definitely helps because Ralph McQuarrie was the one who did some of the earliest and most uh, influential work on Star Wars. So that's uh, something I thought of. More like just uh, being authentic to what was displayed on the video games. Uh, at Ironic Dot Designs is saying ancient or like the games, um, but they kind of had an emphasis with uh, with clunkier droids and ships. And I I kind of see that with the video games where the Ebon Hawk was very kind of like bare bones and the uh, like the droids were very uh, like minimal as far as their functionality what they could do. So yeah, I, I like that. And at Paleonomedicy um, says, uh, not too ancient, but different details, like the handles of lightsabers, costumes, etc. So uh, something that comes to mind is like the, so not too ancient, but different details, like the handles of lightsabers. Um, something that comes to mind is like the High Republic, where you're seeing a little bit of those medieval-like hilts. And so just kind of making a more like a first, first-hand attempts of some of these Star Wars technologies. So... And I think just with, with my conclusion on some of these is um, I I don't see too much harm in kind of keeping the authentic look of the Old Republic. Some of my earlier thoughts that the um, kind of the size of the ships, I think, is a good teller of the kind of the era of Star Wars that we're in, where like the technology is there, but maybe it's not advanced to harness a larger vessel the vessels kind of what was mentioned earlier where they're they're not very intricate maybe just uh just designed to get the job done kind of like a hammerhead corvette is and depicted in some of our star wars stories what do you think cassia i think that the feel and design of the universe is seen in knights of the old republic one and knights of the old republic two and the knights of the old republic comics that went along with the games. They have a good feel to them. They feel a little a little ancient, but it's uh it fits within that universe. And I would be comfortable with the visuals looking something like that. But I mean, if you kind of look at the Star Wars The Older Public trailers, I think that they kind of kind of copied a little bit too much from the prequels or it's kind of like you have like an older public version of the droid kitas that are a little different and then you have republic troopers looking basically like the clone troopers i would want a little bit more originality than that um but i wouldn't want something that looks too foreign and sometimes that can be a hard balance to get right but Maybe just the lightsabers 
looking a little bit different, the Jedi's robes looking a little different, and the droids and the ships looking a little bit chunkier and smaller uh, than you see in the prequel and original and, I guess, sequel trilogies that would kind of make it feel like a little bit of a different galaxy. Because I think if you just have things looking a slightly different, you don't even have to explain that much that this is 4,000 years before the movie you saw in 1977, you know? Like, if you can just get those details right, you don't have to kind of baby an audience and kind of discuss everything so they can understand what's going on. Maybe a maybe kind of a, a minor detail more on the, the worlds of KOTOR is because, well, I think with uh, with the Galactic Republic maybe being a little bit on its earlier phase is the kind of like the less occurring that galactic travel is because it would take a little bit more time and like hyperspace lanes haven't been like fully perfected yet and so things like a, a ship coming to orbit and I guess having that like communication between um, the different worlds is a little bit more of an event than a everyday occurrence. I don't know, just like a just like little things like that that show that that like the, the communication between like government and or like galactic government to local government is less common than something that we see in the prequels where it's you got all kinds of like major traffic hyperspace lanes and things. Yeah, maybe it's like how you know you have like a, a James Bond or a spy film taking place nowadays and they have really bleeding edge technology and then it's like maybe there's like a a period spy film or kind of some of the older James Bond movies where it's like it takes a few days to travel you know kind of mm -hmm. like looking back a bit like that yeah like um personal spaceships like a x-wing is less common if you're going to space you're kind of taking like a space bus or you know, the Ebon Hawk was kind of like an early iteration of like an equivalent to a yacht, kind of like the YC-1300 transport is a like a space yacht. Like that's kind of the high end, the luxury version of space travel is more privatized versus maybe more commonly you'd have to board like a large like commercial vessel to get from planet to planet. Yeah. So I think there is like a lot that a team could come up with and have fun with. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up. So this has been Coden. And this has been Cassia. You can find us on Instagram at Evan Hawk Podcast. And our podcast can be found everywhere that Anchor Podcasts are distributed at the Evan Hawk. And we are always grateful for subscriptions, reviews, and shares. And then you can email us your comments and questions at EvanHawkPodcast at gmail.com. You can um, follow me in various... Uh, Twitch stream days, Thursday evenings, 6 to 7 p.m. I normally tweet when I go live, so it's not every week. But also, I have managed to scrap together my own Instagram account. So if you want to follow me there, just at Code and Bond. Our intro and outro themes were composed by Alistair Shoreman. He can be found at alistairsounds.wixsite.com forward slash Alistair Sounds. Our transition music was composed by Christian Walker. He can be found at christianwalkermusic.com. Uh, this has been episode 24 of the Ebon Hawk. May the force be with you. We'll be back soon. Bye for now.